Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to moderate the most interesting session on the Latin America context. I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Alicia Barcena. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, CEPAL. I'm very glad to be with a very distinguished panel today. And I'm accompanied here by authorities, by um, very distinguished financiers. I have two ministers and one representative from banks. I have uh, on another banker with us. And of course, uh, Moises, who is from the, uh, where, where are you from? Because you were the minister of industry and commerce. And then of course, you're a writer and you're, a, you're in many things. So, but it gives me great pleasure. We have with us Idelfonso Guajardo. He's the minister of economy of Mexico. We have Marcelo Neri. He's the secretary, uh, I mean, you have been now, you have been, confirmed as Minister of Strategic Affairs of Brazil and also in charge of IPEA, which is one of the uh, think tanks, I guess, of the economy in, in Brazil. And of course, we have with us our chair of this, of this session in, in, in Davos, and I'm very glad to introduce Roberto Egidio Setuba, the chief of the executive, uh, vice chairman of the board of directors of Itaú Unibanco Brazil. And of course, Mario Blecher, vice chairman of the Banco Hipotecario de Argentina. Thank you for being with us. And again, of course, Moises Naim, who is a very good friend, and I'm very glad that you were able to, to join us in this panel. Now, what is this panel going to be about? Well, it's not difficult to guess. It's going to be about Latin America. However, what is happening to Latin America? And I would say, what are the core political, social, and economic issues? And what is the moment that Latin America is going through? I think this is. This is the basic question that we really need to know. And, and we want you, the experts in this round table, to help us to, to make everybody clear of where is Latin America today. And the first thing I want to say, if I may, is that I think when we talk about Latin America, we need to be very careful to understand that Latin America has sub-regions. And, and I would say it's not behaving the same way in Central America and Mexico as it is in South America, for example. And, and that the two sub-regions are really very linked to different uh, contexts in a way. Mexico and Central America very much linked to what's happening in the United States, which is uh, having, a, I would say, a good moment or a, a better moment than before, even the IMF today or yesterday published a new figure saying that the U.S. will perform better. It would be from 3.1 to 3.6. So that's good news for Central America and Mexico because they are very linked to that large economy. While in South America we are undergoing different situation. Actually, in CEPAL, we had a, a projection of growth of 2.2% uh, for 2015. And uh, reading the, the IMF, we, we will have to go back to our, to our desks because the IMF pulled it down to 1.3. And basically, it pulled it down to 1.3. And, and we have to, of course, we are going to see if we agree with that. We initially, both of us coincided that it was going to be 2.2, that this year was going to be better than last year. And it's basically because of Brazil. And, and Brazil was supposed to grow importantly, and apparently the, the, the numbers in Brazil are going down. So this is why I think it's so important to have two very distinguished Brazilians with us today that you can may, maybe give us some light. And why is Brazil so important? Because Brazil has a lot of weight in the, in the, in the overall average of the region. But because, as I said before, not all the region is having a difficult time. I would say Brazil, Argentina, and Venezuela are the three economies that are really uh, on the downside. But there are other economies that are doing quite well, I have to say. For example, I would say that uh, some countries that are doing more or less better than, than Argentina and Brazil is Colombia, for example, is Ecuador, is Bolivia. Uh, Chile is also on the, on the slowdown, but still growing. And of course, Central America and Mexico are, are going to have a better performance. Now, did our region took advantage of the boom? I mean, did we really did the structural changes that we needed to do when we had good prices and when we had good, uh, I would say, a good moment for Latin America between 2003 and 2008? I think we did on the social front, Marcelo. I think we, 
really pulled down poverty. Uh, and now poverty is 28% in our last figures, and, uh, and extreme poverty is 12%. We come from a poverty of 50% almost in the 80s. So it, indeed, we did a lot of effort. Indeed, there is a new growing middle class, let's put it that way, with new demands. And I call it new because it's not the middle class as we used to know it. But so let me turn to you, the panelists. Now that the economy is slowing down, exports are also slowing down quite a bit because in 2011, our exports uh, were growing at 23%, and now it's less than 0.8%. So export is not the engine of growth. And of course, consumption has also gone down. You are the, the bankers of our region, and you know that people are not consuming as they did before. So what can we do? And in, our, in, in my institution, we believe that investment has to come back, that that's the only way this region can really achieve some progress. So what do you think? Please help me. OK. Uh, <clears throat> as you describe it, uh, there's so many things going on in Latin America. But I think that basically uh, the, the region is going in, uh, through adjustments, adjustments that are needed uh, because basically the world has changed and has changed and, and this, those changes has been affecting uh, Latin America. Basically we have this deceleration in China which has affected uh, drastically the price of commodities uh, and Latin America is a region where we export a lot of commodities so this is an important portion of the, the external uh, the export income of Latin America. So once this income uh, has reduced because lower prices, uh, our capacity to, to keep the imports has reduced as well. So a lot of adjustments we will have to go through in order to uh, rebalance the, the, the whole economy. And this means devaluation currencies, this means higher, higher interest rates uh, to cope with the inflation that comes uh, from uh, depreciation of the currencies. And on the top of that, we still have uh, the American, comp uh, American economy, which is good news, uh, recovering. But this puts some pressure also in the monetary policy of the Fed. Uh, so this also brings additional effort uh, from a monetary point of view for countries in Latin America. So you have pressures coming out of Latin America that will uh, make the region to, to go through adjustments. We, in the last decade, we have a very good decade. The region was very favorable, exactly for the opposite, uh, and the opposite uh, things, because we had uh, commodity price going up, interest rates going down. So this was very favorable for the region. So we had a very big growth during those, those years. Now we are the way back, coming back to a more normal situation. So we have to adjust. Uh, and probably, I think that we will go through a lower period of growth in the coming years. Ed Alfonso, come in. You, well, you, you ask about the, the ability of Latin America to really capture the bonanza years, to really bring in all the benefits through good times and really capitalize them. I don't think that we have been having that ability. Mexico had a, an oil bonus for more than a decade since 2008 to 2012, and we really wasted more, most of that uh, oil uh, bonus. And I think that also the commodity prices bonanza, or, or really good times in commodity prices, was not really captured in the countries that depend a lot on commodity exports. Uh, we really have to think how to revert that tendency of not putting into real uh, assets when we have good times in Latin America. Now, you make a comment in terms of exports, uh, in terms of the exports is not being the engine for growth. I think the only exception in Latin America is Mexico, because right now, the growth rate of Mexico is basically plain because of the export sector. Our manufacturing is growing at 18% a year, at 9%, and automobile exports are growing by 18%. So in the case of Mexico, being open, about two-thirds of the Mexican economy are open to, the, to foreign trade. When you look at different points in crisis, like the 2008 crisis, or even before the 94 crisis, what brings back the Mexican economy to growth is the export sector. 
And that's exactly what is happening this time, thanks to the fact that the only economy growing in the world is the US economy. Now, for us, 80% of trade is depending upon trade with Canada and the US. And last, just last year, our bilateral trade grew by $13 billion. That's the size of the Nicaraguan economy, just the growth in trade. So I do believe that uh, Latin America had uh, an undone homework that has to be done, and which is to conceptualize the importance of free trade in the region and how we can integrate strongly our value added change in the, in the, in the, in the continent. Thank you, Idelfonso, because there's a point here that I just want to um, bring the paradox, if I may, because that's my role, to provoke. Because uh, Mexico exports around $1 billion a day, or probably in more. Bilateral, in the bilateral, it's more. It, it, well, with the US, no? No, what, uh, the, the figures that you can use for, we're exporting, the bilateral trade is $500 billion with US, billion. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's one billion one and a half. One point something billion, yeah. right? But, 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 my, my provocation is, how the much- National content. Exactly. <laughs> how much of the national content of those exports is let, Mexican? Let me, let me tell because you. Because we believe that that's important. And it's, that's why value chains are so important. Because it's, it's extremely important, and my job depends on it. Exactly. Let me, well, let, not, let me, I don't mean exactly, but I think let so. Me, let, me, <laughs> let, let, me tell you, let me tell you what, what, what is. When, when we started the Maquiladora program back in the 70s, basically Mexico was just putting together parts. Mm -hmm. As you go through time, uh, the auto decree had been converted through time. Today, there are some companies that had Mexican value added of 60% in the auto industry. Some others 40, 65%. And depending upon the industry is how much value added is being done in Mexico. On average, it's 35%. But what I can tell you is that every day, there is a more sophisticated and complex way to put things together with the sign. There is General Electric has a plant in Querétaro with 3,000 Mexican engineers doing the engines for the big, uh, uh, how do you call Aero it? Spacial, no, no, for not, not just for the planes, but that's for okay. turbinas, also for, for, ele for electric power. Here is our director of CF uh, CFA. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the point is that there is every time is more value added, more design and more engineering in the process and goes along with developing your human capacities to really deepen uh, value added. Now, you're right. TV sets, we're the number one exporter in the world, but the value added in TV sets is 5%, yeah, yes, 5%. Yes, so time. there is a long way to go in order to bring the technology and innovation in order to really deepen in that regard. But today, uh, about 30% of the Mexican uh, labor force is employed in highly dynamic, highly integrated industries. Good. Now, let me go to Argentina, Mario. And of course, I want you, Marcelo, to start thinking on something because you spoke about fiscal adjustment, didn't you? Right, which, yes, has to be done. What's going to happen with the social sector? You will tell me later. But Mario, did Argentina, what happened with Argentina? Argentina started so well in, 20, in 2003, in 2003, with great advancement and, you know, what happened? What's going on? Well, uh, of course, that the, the period you mentioned is the period after a very deep crisis. So it was, uh, so it was, very, it was right perfect. Right. But, um, <laughs> No, but in addition to that, we have to recognize we have to recognize that the government of the president of Kirchner, the first government, uh, was able to recover the economy, keeping fiscal balance and keeping external balance. There, there were also external external reasons, but the, the fact is that if you go in an economic history book on Argentina, you never find periods where there was this twin surplus. Uh, and therefore, there was a possible to grow, accumulate reserves, uh, grow with uh, little inflation, until the, these uh, surpluses, these surpluses uh, ex were exhausted. Uh, continuing or even exacerbating these policies at times where the, the, the twin surpluses turn into twin uh, deficits, uh, of course, got this disequilibrium that we have today. That's on the one hand. The second problem uh, has been the problem of, um, uh, of investment that you mentioned. Investment has been very low uh, and has been very low for a number of reasons, including the uncertainty about certain type of policies. 
And that is what, uh, what is uh, happening now. In addition to that, there has been a deterioration, a slight deterioration in terms of trade, not much because of the price of oil. And there was, um, a, I would say, disastrous uh, energy policy that converted, the, uh, turned the balance of payment from, uh, from a surplus into a deficit. And uh, this is what has to be fixed. No? But uh, let me say something in general about Thanks. Latin America, because uh, what we hear here is something that can be summarized very clearly. The party is over. The party for the decade is, is over. And, and this is what uh, we, can, we can observe clearly today. And th th it's over because we go back to the cycles. And one of the reasons, with the big exception of Mexico, uh, is that, uh, as a matter of fact, countries in Latin America continue to be highly dependent on the export of commodities, of primary goods. If you go back to, uh, to Cepal in the, in the 60s, and 50, 60s and 50s, probably, you will see that there are a lot of discussion that can be very, very actual, as a matter of fact, oh, yes. today. And uh, this is uh, one of the problems that I really think that the, the economies have. Brazil is, what, 60% the export of commodities. Uh, Chile and Peru, and Peru is two-thirds, uh, Colombia. Uh, and I think that the uh, investment should, in, in fact, be directed into the diversification of the economy, but diversification to, along lines of comparative advantage, which is gaining uh, on, the, on, the, on the value added of, of the commodities. Argentina has been very uh, successful in one thing in terms of changing the structure, and is to uh, go along the value added chain of, of soybeans. We do not export really too much of the, the beans, we export much higher levels of uh, value added, and there the comparative advantage is unbeatable. You know, you, you mentioned investment, and I think in the region, our, more or less, our rate of investment is 22%, a little bit less even. Those countries that put themselves into investment as a counter-cyclical sort of instrument are better. Colombia, Ecuador, even Chile now is starting to, to, to take shape there. Now, what about institutions? I wonder, Moises, I mean, you have been writing about the end of power and things of the sort. You have been looking at the region and at the world in a way. So what do you think about the institutions, the rule of law? Is that affecting us or not? Or is it only the external context? I know our economies are very dependent on what's happening outside. But what inside? What do we need to do? What's going on there? That's a long-standing uh, issue. You are absolutely right. It's easier to... Uh, institutions have always been weak, and there has been some strengthening in some countries, in some sectors, but in general, institutions continue to be weak, and it continues to be true that it's much easier to adjust a country to do the economic fiscal adjustments, the exchange rate and the fiscal and the monetary. That's, that's difficult, but it's easy. It's doable. We know how it's done. Uh, instead, strengthening institutions and making them work, uh, we know it's needed, but uh, we don't have a lot of examples uh, in which uh, there is a sustained, reliable, permanent, impactful institutional uh, building. And then there is uh, periods of crisis where they wreak havoc in institutions. So when the, the region enters in its um, turbulence associated with the adjustments we're going uh, we're gonna to have, then institutions suffer. Um, and that has been a long-standing pattern. There are some certainties about Latin America. We know that uh, some of the things are going to happen. But there's no doubt that, as Mario said, uh, the, the party is over. There's no doubt that, that an adjustment will be needed. There's no doubt that some countries are going to do do it better and more deeply and more permanently and effectively than others. There's no doubt that others are just going to continue to try to pull the populist uh, uh, agenda. There's no doubt that all the countries that started very strong with reforms, and I'm thinking of Mexico, uh, reforms in education, energy, telecommunications, competition, you, you name 11, it. They, they were, uh, they, you, you name it, they were trying to do it, and I hope they can, but there's also the reality that now they face 
uh, all kinds of surprising uh, uh, events that have created a political environment that is, not, is, is very toxic. The, the, the political environment in Mexico as a result of the security situation and uh, uh, the assassinations of the students, as we know, uh, the, the corruption accusations. So it is very hard to do what, the, what they were already doing, which is incredibly difficult but doing it in an environment in which there is this public that is disappointed, frustrated, and angry is very difficult. And that is not a Mexican-only situation. If you ask me to characterize what will Latin American countries will have in common uh, in, in coming years and what governments will have in common is to deal with very high inertial expectations. Because we come, as, as, as you said, uh, from a, a very good decade in which uh, there was a consumption boom, uh, the, you know, the social conditions in, in countries like Brazil were f almost a miracle in terms of the number of people that were lifted out of poverty in Mexico, uh, elsewhere. You know, things were going well and people were eating more, people were consuming more, people, and, and uh, you know, and that, th that kind of expectation is now deeply ingrained. So now these governments will have to go to their publics and say, you know, there's going to be less of this. And that is going to unleash all kinds of uh, difficulties that some countries are going to manage better. Other countries are going to go or continue to go on an all-out war on checks and balances. We have seen in Latin America another common trend is that governments trying to uh, curtail uh, the checks on their power. We have seen governments throughout the region trying to um, control the mass media, uh, to control the National uh, uh, Assembly, the, the, the Parliament, to control the legislature. You can see in a lot of these countries where governments and politicians are trying to limit uh, the, the, the institutional setting uh, that, that actually characterizes a democracy, which is that you have a, legis a, 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 a government, a president, but the president has a, con a set of constraints, and these governments are going against it. And I finally, again, I, I, uh, there's at the end of a, of, of a commodity cycle or super cycle. The commodity super cycle in Latin America fed a political super cycle characterized by populism in a lot of countries. In some countries, that went beyond the super cycle of populism. Between, it became the X cycle, which is the extreme cycle. Countries went really crazy on populism. Very extreme you know, examples, and I think, of course, of my own country, Venezuela. I think in examples in, in Argentina and, and in others. And that now, they're, you know, they're, 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 the consequences are there for everyone to see. It's a, it's a tragedy of unimaginable human suffering uh, that um, I, I, it's not clear how it's going to end. But I finish just by saying that what is going to characterize Latin American coming years is this constrained, stressed governments trying to fight uh, the constraints and dealing with a very angry public that has now two subjects in mind. One is not to lose the standards of living and the income and the possibilities that they achieve during the, the good years. That's one. And a second, and I think it's to be applauded, but it it, it's dangerous because it has negative consequences, too, in terms of the political dynamics it provokes, is the end of the peaceful coexistence with inequality and corruption. Mm -hmm. um, Latin America, for many, many decades, took for granted inequality. Inequality was a fact of life. Latin America is uh, said to be the region in the world with the highest inequality. And so inequality was something like the weather. You know, you just lived with it. Uh, now, not anymore. Mm. Uh, now, people are not taking it in anymore, and, and, and the fight against inequality has become a very important issue uh, that is in the agenda everywhere. And the second, very much associated with this, is uh, corruption. Uh, people are not willing to, to sit down and just take it anymore. Unfortunately, the, the war on corruption is also driven by scandals, is driven by uh, a lot of uh, effervescence and, and media and publicity, and not with a lot of institution building of the kind you mentioned. That is the way to ensure that opportunities for corruption and impunity uh, are less. Thank you, Moises. And this gives me very much uh, you know, Marcelo, when, when, the, um, when people went to the streets in Brazil, remember that? It was not really, not yet the moment we are living now. 
And I remember talking to you and other people. What happened? Why is all these people outside? In Rio, in Sao Paulo, many, many students and young people were out. And um, I would say that, yes, the cycle is back, but I think the region is a little bit more resilient than it was in the 80s, for example. I mean, we are a little bit better in institutional frameworks, in macro prudence, uh, uh, policy, so forth. But, of course, we still have a lot to do. But coming back to this question of, of Moises, people are angry, and it's true. They are angry because of inequality, they are angry because of corruption. And there's another thing that I wanted to ask you about, and that is this terrible, I would say, contradiction between public goods and private goods. People inside their homes have satisfied more or less their durable goods. They buy televisions and this and that, getting indebted or whatever, but they buy their own things, their household. Very good. Outside, outdoors, the moment they step out of their house, no public goods, security, corruption, uh, I don't know, I mean drugs, uh, no transport. Uh, so how, how do we cope with this, number one, and how do we impede that in Latin America happens what in Europe? We need adjustments, of course, but if we only go for fiscal adjustments and we stop investing in social programs, that also could be a program, problem for us, isn't it? Marcelo. Sure. Um, I, I believe uh, this is really a new decade, the 2010s we, we see. Uh, first, growth was good for the whole continent in different speeds across countries. This is not so much true these, these last years, these last two, three years. The last decade was very good in terms of inequality. Inequality fell almost all over Latin America from very high levels. It's not true anymore. Latin America inequality has been stagnated since 2010. The same thing in Brazil. So inequality, the, so the two parts, the growth part, we are not doing so well, and the inequality part also, uh, we are stuck. Um, and I, I believe we should uh, try to recover this middle path. We have to do both things at the same time. You know, inequality is still very, very high because actually all this fall of inequality, we are back where Latin America was in 1980. In Brazil, we are back where we were in 1960, very, very high level of inequality. So the so social agenda, you know, my role here given by you is to be the so social conscious yes, of... Um, so, um, I believe first we have to do the fiscal adjustment, talking more about the, the Brazilian case. Uh, I think it, this is an opportunity where we have to evaluate which programs, especially in the case of Brazil where we have a very high tax burden, a very high public spending, is the opportunity to, to, to separate the good programs from the bad programs. So, we should not just be cutting things, but cutting things, looking at the more efficient and equity, it's really an opportunity. Um, I think in the case of Brazil, um, th there is a, some sort of a paradox uh, where, for example, you get 2012, 2013, and probably 2014, you had very slow growth, GDP per capita, GDP grew something like 0.8% a year, so very small but per capita household incomes grew at 5.5 per year. Mm -hmm. So, and it's growing for all over, all the segments. So it's, we are not more anymore in the decade where the poor get the highest gains. Everyone got gains in terms of, you know, all over the income distribution, growth for everybody, but not backed by GDP growth. So there is a, and I think this didn't reach yet 2014 labor market in Brazil, which is the main source of income, is still growing, not, not only very low level of unemployment. So the political difficulties will be quite hard when, if you decelerate, if you take back this household income growth, although you know, GDP growth is very, is, is very small. 
So, for example, last two years, uh, last year, for example, had something like 2.7 million to low middle class, another 1.6 to high middle class in Brazil to a traditional middle class. So the process is still going on. And since we are a democracy, you have you know, feedback, not only for social welfare. And, um, and, uh, and part of these, the point you were, you were mentioning, that uh, you know, how is life outside houses, our houses, uh, part of it is getting worse because of the good side. It's a collateral effect, you know, people bought cars, and you know, uh, we have to, to live in a, you know, in a traffic like jam a every day because the public investment didn't follow at the same pace. So I, I agree with Moisés that we have very uh, high inertial expectations. And with uh, uh, additional point, which is, uh, is worse than that. I think our uh, ability to, uh, to go through down turns mm -hmm. is much, we are much less tolerant than the gains we perceive when it, it went up. So I think this politically, I think, and to some, just to put a, a, a point on the, on, the, on the table, it's a very, uh, maybe true for Latin America, but part of the protests in Brazil, which is not uh, first, you know, the, pro the agenda of protests didn't go through the elections. I mean, it didn't affect very much the outcomes of the elections one year later. So we have to be careful. Uh, other, 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 other issues dominated the scene. And the, the point I would like to raise is the following. In part, the protests, uh, people don't like inequality, but people are also uh, annoyed by the fall of inequality for political economic reasons as well. Basic, simple political economic reasons. So we are stuck. If inequality stays, it's bad. If it falls, it's bad for some. The, the, what, what I see is our possibility especially in the case of Brazil, is that um, we have a, a, a hidden variable, which is uncertainty. And uh, by means of a confidence shock, that's what we are trying to do now. Mm. I think you know, it's a Pareto improvement. Everyone can win. It's different from income inequality, where you have good news for some, bad news for the others. I think a confidence shock is good for everyone. So I think this is the... Confidence, very important. Roberto, what do you think? You know, I, I think listening to everybody here, we, are, we have a very common ground, which is very clear that we had a, we recognize that we had very good years in the last decade. We uh, did not uh, take the advantage of this, those good years in order to create stronger institutions. We did not that in Latin America, mainly. Uh, we basically did not the investments that we could have done uh, and most countries, uh, especially in Brazil, they uh, increased the consumption, which was very popular, very good for, for, uh, you know, from many perspectives. But now that this cycle is going out, uh, is ending, uh, we have a problem because we are not able to keep uh, the good news, especially for low-income people, those who are favored by uh, that cycle. Uh, I think the challenge that we have now is this one, how to keep uh, the improvements in place, uh, the gains, the social gains in place. And I think that one thing that was very clear in, in, in Brazil uh, in those uh, manifestations was the fact that people is becoming uh, tired of inefficiency, of mismanagement of the public sector, of corruption. Because at the end of the day, those things basically reduce the output, uh, and what kind of any kind of output, social output, physical output, uh, the inefficiency, corruption uh, makes uh, the possibilities uh, much uh, lower. So I think there, I, I think that we will see much more pressure uh, now because when you are in improving everything, corruption is not felt uh, because things are improving. But when uh, things are not improving anymore and you have to become more efficient and have to, 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 to do everything that's possible to, to improve the output, 
uh, then corruption becomes much more uh, felt, uh, much more severe. People become much more aware of that. Uh, so I think that probably we will see this becoming uh, as is it in, in, in Brazil right now because of the Petrobras uh, issue. I think the discussion is on the table. Uh, and laws are on the table. So the Supreme Court is called to to, to discuss that, which is a very big issue, that we will involve clearly uh, a lot of politicians, a lot of big companies, and this will be something very important to see how we will get to the other side. Let me go to the public, if I may, uh, uh, Mario, unless you yeah, want to... Me, just as, they, in, just as they, they say in Congress, chance to reply to his comments. Of course, please. Uh, what, happened, what happened, Moises made a very good point in terms of institutional building, and he had prized the Mexican reforms. Uh, and it's in the center of equality mm -hmm. and, and trying to make a society more, more just. And, and uh, if you look into what's happening in Mexico, once you open the economy and you have all those rigidities in your system, who is really getting the gains from opening the economy? The big companies, the, war, the ones that are linked into the international system. But when you try to get winners in the small and medium-sized firms, the fact is that for them, was more difficult to get cheap electricity, get financing at competitive prices, trying to buy inputs for their industry at competitive prices when we have very, very highly concentrated markets. The OECD made a study where they conclude that Mexicans were paying 40% more than other citizens in the world for the same goods thanks to highly concentrated markets. So, when you look at that, you really need to open opportunities for everybody to really join into the productive process. And in order to increase productivity, you have to open these opportunities for everybody. So in the center of the effort that Mexico has done in six economic reforms, plus other five that had to do with the judiciary system and electoral reforms, you need to really take into account that you are trying to make the country a country that is more ready to open opportunities for all. And the implementation of the reforms where we are right now had to happen soon for the people to support them. Because if not, they don't know what you're talking about. As of January, the guy sitting right there has reduced electricity prices for the industry by 16%, mm -hmm. for, the, for the commercial sector by 10%, for the domestic households by 4 and 2%. So you have to really make people f feel the impact of what you are doing. And at the same time, uh, at the same time that you're moving ahead, you have to make financial credit more available for small business and to really give opportunities to society. The problem is that the guys that are always opposed to this type of changes, at the moment we were approving this by consensus of all political parties, they could not stop the process of consensus building. The fact, and he is right, at a point in time when we have a problem in Iguala, the state of Guerrero, it was the right excuse for all these groups opposing the educational reform, opposing uh, the, the energy reform, to really take that as a lead and come out in protest. Now, let, let me also make very, very, very precise about the size of the problem. Mexico has 32 federal entities. Of those 32, the problem is highly concentrated in two of them, Guerrero and Michoacán. Obviously, there is a political movement that has been extremely successful in portray that has in a bigger image for the country. I'm from Monterrey, and when you look the country, it is exactly the tale of two Mexicos. The center northern part of Mexico has been very dynamic, highly integrated, and the south part of Mexico. Why educational reform was very important? Because I'm the result of public education in the north of Mexico. And I can assure you that somebody <coughs> being born on the same year that I was in Oaxaca will not have exactly the same opportunities I do have because Oaxaca has been kidnapped by a union that is really restricting the development of human rights and, and, and the development of children in that part of the country. So what the president did the last week of November is that we have the responsibility to guarantee the same conditions for justice, security, and, and opportunities for those southern states than what we have in the rest of Mexico. And I agree with Moises. This is the next challenge for Mexico. If we do not guarantee 
exactly the same quality of life for all Mexicans, then we are jeopardize, jeopardizing the future of the Mexican development. But uh, the fact is, that's exactly where, where the next effort has to be concentrated, realizing that not just putting things under the carpet for the last 30 years is going to solve the problem, but you have to face the challenge. No, it's a good point, and I think it, it coincides with confidence, corruption, transparency. How do we bring that back to the equation? Because our countries are facing this for different reasons. I wanted to bring somebody from the public that we have around us, because many of you are very knowledgeable. And, and, and just to say that in, in terms of reforms, just let me put an example of the fiscal reform. And I'm sorry I saw Mauricio Cárdenas step away, but he's undergoing a, a very important fiscal reform in Colombia. And his major problem is political, not technical. It was the same in Mexico, I think. And there are other 12 countries that are undergoing fiscal reforms to try to go for, for more progressive taxation. It's not the case in Brazil. You're already over 30%, although indirect taxes. But anyway, but it's not the case in Brazil. It's not the case in Argentina. But it's the case, at least in Central America and Mexico, the tax burden is very low. However, the companies and the entrepreneurs don't like this. So I would like to listen to on some views <laughs> from the audience. We have also Ricardo Hausmann here. Do you think these are the problems, Ricardo? Do we have to go further? Do we have to, you have spoken about, you have spoken many times about diversification of, of productivity, the low productivity, the innovation, the technology. Where does that uh, stand? I don't know if there's a microphone for Ricardo. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was listening very attentively to, to the discussion, and, and I think that the, the, it, it has a little bit of a flavor of uh, uh, pessimism, and it has a little bit of a flavor of very conservative, in the sense that we want to preserve the past, the gains of the past, not lose the gains of the past, and how can, and, and, and how can we sure, you know, uh, more equality, and the, our only idea, our only contribution to the world is conditional cash transfers, which is sort of like palliative or very long run. But I didn't hear sort of like a discourse of ambition, of imagination, of, okay, so what are the new things we're going to be doing that we're not doing now? What are the new things that we're going to be exploiting with the technologies that are coming up? Are we going to be a player of those technologies? Are we, are we just going to be uh, observers of what other people are doing? Is our agenda to balance our books and to improve uh, rule of law and institutions? Or do we have something that is really more ambitious in terms of um, you know, the imagination we have about our future? You know, the European Union, is a, is, a, is a region with 20, how many countries? 28 countries and probably 35 languages. We're a region of, you know, 20 countries and one language plus Brazil, right? And <laughs> now, important, very now, important. Does I Latin say. America has a vision right. of itself? Uh, or, you know, the only thing we've done is we've transformed Mercosur into a bad joke. We've created a bunch of institutions that have done nothing to the, the, the collective defense of democracy. We have, we have a, a laughed our way out of the a democratic charter. We have, in this moment, a human catastrophe happening in Venezuela, and there is no diplomatic initiative of anything. So, so where is the ambition, the, the super ego of this region, the imagination, the aspiration of this region for the 21st century. I am sure, I'm sorry I didn't hear it. Oh, very nice, yes, great. Wait, wait, no, 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 Ricardo, this is fantastic. I want to thank you very much for that intervention and I have Gerardo Candiani in front of me. Yes, and I tell you why, Gerardo, because you are a very powerful entrepreneur in Mexico and one of the initiatives that I think has been uh, an important initiative has been the Pacific Alliance, for example. So what are the, the possibilities of the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur? We just had a dialogue in Chile uh, between the Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance. And a lot of opportunities are emerging from that. 
from intra-regional cooperation, from intra-regional coordination. We only have 19% of intra-regional trade. Right. Europe has more than 60. That means that 60% of their exports go to Europe. In our case, only 19, and we are going down instead of up. So is this initiative something that can bring innovation, creation? What do you think? You can answer in Spanish if you want to. Yes. Or give us your view. Bueno, puedo... I can speak in Spanish. I think we all speak Spanish here. I think the uh, process that we've witnessed in Mexico is very important. All of the reforms that we've made over the last uh, couple of years have made Mexico a far more competitive country. The level of integration and penetration that we're witnessing in um, Mexico, uh, together with North America, is around 30, 40 percent. So I think in the coming years, what we will see is a very important process, ongoing reforms, uh, which will fundamentally change Mexico's situation. And our links with Latin America, the Pacific Alliance, uh, is also a very important approach, very relevant. What we are facing, the significant challenges ahead, have been, have been touched upon in this discussion. Um, and what we're behind in the private sector is how to push growth, how to fully implement the reforms, and our other priority is capacity building, strengthening uh, the Mexican institutions. We are promoting the state of law, the rule of law, uh, securities, justice, democracy, and uh, doing or putting an end to corruption. Now, that certainly uh, would be of great benefit to Mexico, would also be in harmony with what's needed in the rest of Latin America. I think we're on the right track. I think uh, the major issue uh, which we also need to bear in mind is fiscal reform. What we want to see is a strengthening of internal consumption and demand, uh, strengthening the market, investment, and creating jobs. What we are seeking at the moment are changes which, um, as the Secretary has said, is the importance of building the domestic market, which is so important for Mexico. We are continuing on a path of integration, uh, opening up there to historic developments with the Pacific Alliance. We need to continue on the path of reform. Um, implementing those changes uh, that are necessary for Mexico to continue moving forward. The justice, democracy and corruption, five points, very key points. Let me come back to the panel and let's see if we can answer or not answer, but at least uh, step up uh, our expectations. Mario. Yeah, yeah, I want to comment on Ricardo. Uh, I generally agree with him in, 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 in the point that he made about the vision generally, because there are things that have to be taken, taken into consideration. You cannot build uh, if you don't know what has been done wrong. I mean, you need to, to look at, the, at, the, at what has been done. And a uh, pessimist is no more than an optimist with some experience. I mean, that's not, no, 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 not a particular point. But I agree with him that, uh, that uh, we, you need a vision. And uh, look, you can look at this in the, form, in the following way. Uh, we have better institutions, yes, than we had before. We had better economic policies, but not, uh, the institutions are not as good as they should be. The economic policy is not as good as it should be. Why? One of the reasons is because we have tended to, to copy institutions, to take a model and, and copy it. And I think that in many cases have not been the appropriate institution. For example, if we do have these super cycles, we need institutions that deal with the super cycle, and economic policies that deal with the super cycle. Um, I personally, for example, see that Latin America has made bad usage of the idea of uh, central bank independence, and I can elaborate on that in a different uh, opportunity. But I think that the, was the, the in attempt to copy institutions without developing our own and those that really need, are needed for our own purpose is, is, is one of the problems. The second problem is the, the idea about the role of the government. We saw that the less government, the better, and it's not the case. 
the better government, the better, but not the, the less government, the better. And if we are talking about investment, we are talking also about inf infrastructure. Who is going to finance infrastructure in Latin America? And uh, what about the development of human capital? You need better government, you need le less corruption or whatever you want to, to, to do in order to improve the government. But that's not necessarily that less, you need less government. Um, but we tend to adopt this, these rules that came from other places. And I think that there is where the vision should be. What institutions are really appropriate for the needs and for, for the conditions of the region? What is our ambition, Moises? I'm going to argue against ambition and against imagination. Mm. <laughs> Amonos. <laughs> All right. <coughs> I like it. <laughs> um, how can one not agree with the appeal to do more creative, imaginative things? But let me give you examples of imagination and ambition in Latin America. Who would disagree here that one of the most imaginative and ambitious leaders we have had in Latin America is not Hugo Chavez? He was ambitious. He changed the country. He had the ambition to change the whole region. He exported his revolution. He developed links to other places uh, in the world that we had not had before. So if you go down the list, of imagination, of ambition, of Hugo Chavez, he's at the top. He would be an answer during it. You know, here I am. If he was here, he will tell you, what are you talking about? I have been ambitious. I have been, my imagination ran wild. I did, I, I changed the world. The same, and Nestor Kirchner, Christina Kirchner, Danny Ortega. I am being facetious. I am, I am, I am yes. of course, I am. A little bit, huh? uh, I am <laughs> provoking. Bit. But you, 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 you see <laughs> my point. My point is, of course, how can one not be agree with Ricardo? Of course, his description of the embarrassing behavior of some of the large countries in terms of what's happening in the region and in, in diplomacy, in letting a lot of the things he says are impossible to disagree with. But my point is that it is not enough to prescribe ambition and imagination. We need to define how and who, def actually, wh who, whose ambition are we talking about? Societies. Uh, well, so, well, Hugo Chavez will tell you that he represented all of his, the poor of the country. Christina Kirchner and Lula and, <laughs> and Dilma will tell you that they represent the nation. That they, they their well, social policies, they did. their yes. social policies, their all everything they've done is representative of the, what the country uh, wanted and is unprecedented. And look where we, where we are. So all I'm saying is, of course we need ambition, of course we need imagination, but let's be very careful on how we define who, whose ambition, whose imagination, and how you execute. As you know. Ambition and imagination without execution or with bad execution or with bad ideas are very dangerous. Imagination and, uh, uh, and, and, and ambition can be a variant of populism that is very dangerous. I, 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 will, I will just uh, come back to you. take upon the Ricardo's uh, original intention about uh, ambition and imagination. Give you very simple examples. Of course, I, I understand uh, that warning that uh, Moises is making, but give you in Alianza Pacifico, one of the commitments we did besides liberalizing trade within the four countries was eliminating visas for Peru and Colombia. Tourism from Peru and Colombia has increased by 62% in Mexico in the last uh, six to seven months. Now, obviously, you have a risk. You can get some crim criminals traveling. But then you have to use the right technology, the right cooperation with the countries to really prevent and secure your borders against organized crime <coughs> going across. You, do, you are not going to hurt your touristic sector by doing restrictions all over the place. The other example, and we are still fighting with the Alianza Pacifico, why are we so protective of fifth li liberties in, in, in flights in, in the region? We should open skies. We, we should liberalize uh, maritime uh, uh, movements of ships in the region. Do not make any, any restrictions on cabotage stopping within national territory because our logistics of communication are terrible. That's why our value chains are not linked. So if we really want an America, Latin America integrated, we have to do everything is in our power to really connect Latin America. And today we are still far apart from doing it. Even, even Alianza, Alianza Pacifico, 
Yes, we receive half of the investment going to the region. Yes, we are a very important part of the GDP. But <coughs> Latin America without Brazil and without Argentina is not complete. So the next step has to do at least with deregulating the way we do business together, making more efficient borders, facilitating custom procedures, and really making things happen. Because otherwise, rather than going to facilitation of trade, I mean, we used to have a free trade in the auto sector. All of the sudden, it was uh, canceled unilaterally by Brazil and Argentina. We have to renegotiate a partial opening of the of, of, of trade. The three years before that, Mexico was had a deficit. But when we started having a surplus, our neighbors didn't like it. And so but the, the point at the end is why should we stop the market growing and benefit all the region by just liberalizing trade? So at the end of the day, I think that there are actions that we can take that can be really innovative and challenging to really open the region for a more prosperous future. Marcelo. OK, to get the uh, Ricardo Hausmann provocation, I think it's uh, education, of course, is the key. Uh, it's good for growth, it's good for inequality, it's good for imagination as well, good imagination. And um, you know, to, 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 to get uh, uh, his point, uh, I think in Latin America, Brazil in particular, but Latin America, we are very close uh, immigration-wise. We have to open our borders not only for trades, for capital, but for people. In Brazil, we have only 0.3% of immigrants first generation. So we have a big, big... Um, the second thing on education is uh, the youth. Uh, I see. I, I see a very. I'm very concerned because although the youth is improving <coughs> uh, in terms of education and other dimensions, they are not improving during the youth years. We are having, and the youth in Brazil has, in Latin America as a whole, has never been so big in the past, and will not be as big in the future. So we we really have to invest. To, to work and, and to, I mean, to, to see the future, the imagination will come from the youth. And I think our youth is not, I mean, the protests come from the youth to a large extent. But, you know, uh, the youth themselves, they don't know what they want. Their parents don't know what they want. And the government, even less so. So I think you really uh, have to engage, use technology, but especially, I mean, we, I think we have uh, education challenge. We have the instruments that we, we didn't have before, but we have to use them. You know that we are making a radiography of the 22% of young people between 15 and 30 years that do not work nor study. We discover a very interesting fact. I, I know we are a minority here, but women, the women factor is very important. No, and I'm, I'm very serious because if all the women could go into the labor force in the same conditions as men in terms of time because they don't have to take care of the elders or the children or whatever and they are paid the same thing, our calculation is that poverty will diminish from 2 to 10 percent according to different countries. 10 percent in Bolivia, 2 percent in Argentina because you already have a lot of parity. But, I mean, it's serious. We have to look into that in that uh, segment of, of population with an open view. Young men, young women that are very well prepared because today the, our young people are more educated than ever, but they don't find jobs. Roberto, what do you think? Ambition. <laughs> uh, the good ambition is good, but I totally agree with Moises. I think that the... Uh, uh, when we talk about vision, strong visions and ambitions and things like that, uh, usually, especially in our region, it comes together with a charismatic leader. And I don't think that's what we need. Although the region is probably the best region in the world to produce charismatic leaders, we are very good on that. Uh, but I don't think that, that that's the solution. I think that over time we have suffered a lot because of that. I think the way to go is to build strong democracy, strong institutions, a lot of emphasis on education. I think. Uh, Marcel is correct. 
education is the key for the future, is the key uh, for, for instit creating institutions. So I think that we have a long way to go. There's no miracle, there's no vision that will solve the problems, but we have to work very hard. Thank you, Roberto. I want to thank you all because I think this panel has been very interesting. I cannot finish without saying that my quest in life <laughs> is equality. That's because I believe that all of this, trade, economics, da 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 da, da is to have people have a better life, better welfare. What I believe we need in Latin America is structural changes. That is, how do we move from low productivity to high productivity? Innovation, technology, knowledge. These are the things that we're missing. Education is one of them, but it's not the only one. We have to make sure that we are all up and running in the new technologies. We're very far behind. So I hope we will be able to do something. You wanted to, do we have a minute, Fernando? There's somebody that wants a young man. I cannot say no. He's between 15 and he's between 15 and 30. He's probably, he's probably, you know, <laughs> the 78 percent that is, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Andres. I'm a global shaper from the Caracas Hub in Venezuela, and I just wanted to add a reflection and also sort of a question. Uh, first, I hear we hear a lot about uh, making uh, democracy stronger and um, going against corruption, but. Uh, it ends there. I mean, mm. corru corruption, we're not gonna get rid of it if we don't uh, know and tell people and know the causes. For example, if, is it due to immature politicians? Is it due to lack of transparency, lack of accountability? So that's something that needs to be addressed and, and, and tell not, not the people, but the politicians, the people that, that need to take care of the rule of law. And the, <clears throat> the second one, and it's, uh, it's very important, is that uh, it took this panel uh, to talk about the youth one hour. And uh, we have a demographic dividend in Latin America. We need to talk about the youth uh, even more in order to, 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 you know, to have uh, better results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. I think you, you are the perfect you know, ending of this panel. The answers will be, I would suppose, responded in the dinner, right, Fernando, in the dinner of Latin America, because, because you, you are raising something that I really think is very important. Young people are also in need of information. They want access to information, open government, open everything, and they want to be part of the accountability process, I think. And, and we have to open up our institutions to be able to be looked at by the young people. So thank you very much all. Have a very nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you.